Humans, Turians, Asari, Salarians, Geth, Creepers, Husks, and Reapers. These are just a fraction of what lives in this galaxy. Some of them familiar, some of them relatable, some of them exotic, some of them erotic, some of them alien, and some of them beyond comprehension, but all of them are more than they appear. This is the galaxy I fell in love with back in 2008. A galaxy full of mystery waiting to be explored, a galaxy with so many stories to tell, a galaxy that was meant to turn a whole new generation onto science fiction by standing atop the shoulders of the giants that came before. This game would propel a rising star to the forefront of the industry as one of the premier RPG studios. It would coin so many words, phrases, memes, and figures that would become instantly recognizable paragons for a new breed of RPG players. It would chart a course for an adventure that, for better or for worse, an entire generation of gamers would embark upon. It would create something so monolithic that calling its remaster the Legendary Edition is really not at all hyperbole. Mass Effect was Bioware's first attempt at breaking out and starting their own universe from scratch after having worked on licensed IPs like Star Wars and Baldur's Gate. What we ended up getting, if you ask me, was Bioware's finest work of storytelling and world building. Gameplay-wise, Mass Effect is very rough, but what we get outside of the driving and shooting mechanics is a story few, if any, have matched or exceeded, Bioware included. Before you click off this video because I just dissed a lot of games in one sentence, hear me out. Nothing Mass Effect 1 does is truly revolutionary. It's actually one of the most by-the-numbers games Bioware did. Following a very well-established formula they themselves had created years before Mass Effect. But it's the fact that every component of its writing, the plot, the setting, the characters, and the themes were all just done so well that makes this game stand out in the crowded field of story-rich RPGs. There's greatness and glory to be had in originality, but there's just as much to be gained from doing something truly well, and that's what Mass Effect is. A familiar story just told really well. Most, if not all of us, know where this journey ultimately leads, and one day I'll cover that, but today I just want to look at what made Mass Effect 1 so damn special. What did it do to establish a universe, introduce a cast of colorful characters, and spin a gripping plot that immediately put the franchise on the map? To get us going though, it's best to start where all RPGs start, character creation. This isn't your usual blank slate, no background, all foreground character. Shepard is something different. Shepard is something altogether quite genius. Having a character with some predefined background in an RPG isn't really anything new, even back in 2008. But the smattering of background traces is a nice touch. There's a total of six backgrounds available to choose from. Three personal backgrounds and three professional backgrounds. And these start to define who my Shepard will be before the game has even begun. I tend to go with the Earthborn War Hero mix because reasons, making my Shepard a lowborn orphan from the slums of Earth who ended up joining the Systems Alliance Navy. He then proved himself when a band of alien slavers came to attack a human colony by showing courage and skill on the battlefield. Sounds like your typical great stoic hero, right? The underdog who rose up to be the champion of the people? I knew you didn't have what it takes, Shepard. If you can't be useful, you'll be publicity. When we're through telling our story, the aliens will all know what the first human specter really is. You think I care what the aliens think of me, Finch? But this is your career. You'd throw it all away like that? I can legally execute everyone in this bar. You think the council cares about my shady past? The Spectre has overcome a troubled youth to lead a proud military career. The Turians would not care about such things. And I doubt your lies would fool the Salarians or the Asari. Fine, Shepard, you're right. You're not one of the Reds. Maybe you never were. That man is a xenophobe who thinks he can blackmail a Spectre. You should have killed him. I didn't need target practice. Don't you have a prisoner to guard? Goodbye, human. It'll be interesting to see what kind of specter you turn out to be. This is the genius of Shepard as a character. These backgrounds only tell us the facts, it leaves the rest up to us to decide. There's other backgrounds we can go with, the colonial refugee, the sole survivor, the ruthless go-getter, 
but all of these are meant to only create an impression of who Shepard is. What will come to define him or her is our choices as the player, like any good RPG. These choices will also be what define Shepard's career in the military and the greater world of galactic politics. Politics, you might ask? Yes, I might answer, this is a game about politics. Case in point, we don't start the game shooting like some other games. We start the game standing and sitting around talking, talking about our jobs, no less. Reservoir Dogs, taken at face value, is an action film about a bunch of professional thieves botching a heist and a lot of people dying. And it definitely fits the bill as an action film, but it's an action film that asks us to contemplate the actions of the men on screen, and the implications of those actions. Its introduction sequence is one of the most recognized openings in cinema history, partly because it's an action film that starts with a bunch of guys just sitting around in a diner talking about tipping. It's signaling to the audience in the first scene that this movie isn't about cool guys committing cool violent crimes, it's about the impact of the cool violent crimes on the cool guys and the world itself. Mass Effect more or less pulls a Reservoir Dogs. It's definitely an action RPG, there will be plenty of cool guys and gals committing plenty of cool violence, though more righteous, but it starts with people just talking. The action of this game has purpose, and we are given that context before we are allowed to fire our first shot. We are given a reason to care about the action to come. Once again, in Reservoir Dogs, we care about the fate of all these thieves because we are given a taste of their magnetic personalities, and even though we are told some of them lit up with a bunch of cops and civilians, we still care about their fates to some extent because of the investment right out of the gate. So if we can care about the fates of some lowlives after a single cleverly written conversation, what can a studio like Bioware, renowned already for their ability to write characters, do with a whole ship of upstanding career military folk? They basically work magic, turning a ship full of potential trope-riddled strawmen into something resembling characters within just 15 minutes and 4 conversations. They start us off with Joker, the colorful helmsman who doesn't come across as your typical career-minded flight officer, contrasting him with Kaden Alenko, who is very much the career-minded lieutenant. And then we got Shepard who can swing either way based on our choices. Further up deck, there's Navigator Presley, who's not too shy about showing his xenophobic views that relying on aliens might not be in humanity's best interests overall. He gives us insight into a human political military organization still struggling to find its footing and identity in this brave new galaxy. With humans still being newcomers to the galactic community and that discovery and introduction being unpleasantly bloody, there's plenty of humans who think it might be best to just keep aliens at arm's length and focus on self-dependence instead. We are, after given the exposition, allowed to have Shepard put in his own two cents, which is a pattern that will repeat itself throughout the game, because this is a game about discovery. Discovering a world, its people, its history, its politics, and discovering who our Shepard is. There's a balancing act Byra has to strike to justify all this exposition. After all, a lot of people consider what they are telling Shepard to be common knowledge. We the players don't know any of this, but why doesn't Shepard? Well, they basically settle on the explanation that Shepard is some backwater yokel who just hasn't seen the galaxy much up until this point. And you know what? This approach actually works quite well. Sometimes the simplest solution really is the best one. The conversation pattern repeats a couple more times, giving us insight into the super-legal shadow organization known as the Spectres and the long-extinct Protheans whose technologies all spacefaring species rely upon to travel the stars. Both of these things will become critical to Shepard over the course of the story. Captain Anderson and the Turian Spectre Nihilus fill Shepard in on what's really going on. The Normandy is needed to make a covert pickup from the human colony of Eden Prime. The rub is that they are picking up a Prothean beacon, and those things are so valuable that certain groups in this part of space might risk starting a goddamn war to get a hold of it. Seeing as the Normandy is a state-of-the-art stealth frigate, the Galactic Ruling Council figured they ought to send a Spectre along just to make sure this thing goes smoothly. He's also there to evaluate Shepard to be the first human candidate for the Spectres, a very important honor humanity has been greasing the political wheels for years to earn. And once we are shown all the cards and given a personal stake in this whole thing, being a galactic cop with near unlimited authority does sound pretty neat after all, the first of many wrenches is thrown into the gears. Get down!
It's not long before Shepard, Caden, and Jenkins are dropped into the thick of it, with Nihilus playing support off camera. Living up to his namesake, though, Jenkins doesn't last very long. Rip right through his shields. We're out of chance. Leave him. We need to finish the mission. Aye, aye, sir. It's all good because we pick up Ashley Williams just a few moments later, running from these things, which she accurately identifies as Geth. This enigmatic synthetic race, after having chased their creators off their homeworld, haven't been heard from in centuries. No one knows why they'd be out here now attacking some random human colony, unless they are interested in the beacon as well. This is all confirmed a few minutes later when our boy Nihilus gets shot in the back by another Turian and fellow Spectre, Saren. He is then seen a few minutes later instructing the Geth to set demolition charges to blow up the whole colony, and then goes and gets mind fucked by the Prothean Beacon. But not so fast because Shepard, who has been killing Geth and helping locals along the way, is here to save the day. Besides, I'm not a snitch. Would you rather be a snitch or a corpse? Too many people died here for you to start jerking me around. Say goodnight, Manuel. You cannot silence the truth. My voice must be heard. <coughs> oh my god! What did you do? That might have been a little extreme, Commander. You can't just go around whacking people in the head. Just a little bump on the head. Let him sleep it off. I suppose you're right. By the time he wakes up, the meds will have kicked in. After having his brain turned to spaghetti by the beacon, Shepard wakes up on the Normandy with the captain looking very displeased, and a disturbing garbled vision seared into his brain. Nobody knows what to make of it, or the Geth, or that giant claw ship, or the fact that a Turian Spectre was running the whole show. They need to make an appeal to the council, because this is all way too above any of their pay grades. Shepard is pissed about the whole thing, but Anderson tells him to calm his ignorant yokel ass down because getting hot and bothered by this isn't the way he's going to be able to get into the Spectres. Because, oh yeah, with Nihilus dead, that's up in the air now too. Are you intrigued yet? Because I sure as hell was by the time I got to this point in my first playthrough. Because Byward did the legwork, Eden Prime is more than just a tutorial segment to teach us how to shoot dudes, or in my case, fling them around like ragdolls because I'm playing as an adept. We are given a lot of time to stack bodies, skill points, gear, friends, and allies to begin forming who our Shepherd is going to be. But really, it's all about getting us invested. Ignorance becomes a theme in these early hours of the game as the player is forced to piece things together along with Shepherd and company. Nobody here is a wealth of knowledge on anything, or at least nothing that's transpiring at the moment. This leaves us able to explore the world and give us questions to try and answer, which is how Bioware continues to increase our stake in this world. First, they made us buy into it with its characters and its charm, and now it's hooking us more with a tantalizing mystery. This is a quest for knowledge and power, and we just so happen to be headed for the heart of all that galactic knowledge and power. This is an outrage! The Council would step in if the Geth attacked a Turian colony? The Turians don't found colonies on the borders of the Terminus systems, Ambassador. Humanity was well aware of the risks when you went into the Traverse. What about Saren? You can't just ignore a rogue Spectre. I demand action! You don't get to make demands of the Council, Ambassador. Citadel Security is investigating your charges against Saren. We will discuss the CSEC findings at the hearing, not before. This whole introduction sequence is brilliant, even if I've grown tired of it after having seen it literally 40 or 50 times at this point. It perfectly shows just how inconsequential humanity is on the galactic stage at the moment. Most of the crew has never even seen the Citadel, the heart of galactic governance, let alone have any clout there. No wonder the Council treats us like outsiders. We'd be just another drop in a bucket they already can't carry. They must figure us for one more gang of FNGs looking for a handout. I doubt it's personal. It's gotta be a balancing act, like every other government. Shepard gets to meet Counselor Udina, a hard-headed bully of a politician, but to his credit, he is the guy when it comes to playing politics with the aliens. He's pissed about the whole situation, especially since he knows this is going to be a real uphill battle, seeing as they are accusing the Counselor's favorite specter of some pretty nasty shit. This is a touchy subject for a dozen reasons, between the beacon going boom and the Turians and humans once being at war and potentially going to war over this again. Shepard managed to land in the middle of it all, and the council's stonewalling is not inspiring confidence. 
Shepard and his squad are turned loose on the Citadel and told to meet Udina and Anderson up at the Council Chambers when they are ready. This gives us the first opportunity to explore on our own terms and begin interrogating every named NPC for as much lore as we can. We get some more interesting backstory of the world and I hope you're taking notes with these conversations because it all comes up quite a bit later in the game. And that's what I love about Mass Effect 1. It does so much work setting up its world and unlike some other franchises, a ton of this knowledge comes in handy much later on. Like, what would be the point of a quest for knowledge if a lot of what you learn turns up to be useless fluff? Of course, if you want fluff, you can turn to the Codex, which will give you all the info dumping your little heart can handle. But the stuff the developers decide to put in our faces, especially early on on the Citadel, does have a payout over the course of the game. But we'll be coming back to the Citadel to give it its proper dues later. For now, let's get to the Council and see what's going on. Along the way, we run into Garrus, the Citadel security officer in charge of the investigation into Saren. Garrus was, perhaps on accident, the perfect choice politically for this investigation. He's a Turian, so he does have his loyalties to his people to appease the Turian politicians, but he's also missing that usual stick up his ass most Turians have, especially towards humans, meaning he's actually trying to solve this thing. And his instincts tell him Saren is up to something, but seeing as he's a Spectre, everything about him is classified, and so his investigation was pretty much doomed to stall out. He wishes Shepard luck in convincing the Council, though. Up at the hearing, Saren and the Council take turns talking down to the human applicants, and to be fair, they got good grounds to do so. The only evidence we seem to bring forth is the testimony of a single traumatized dock worker and Shepard's beacon visions, which don't even implicate Saren in the slightest. There is still one outstanding issue. Commander Shepard's vision. It may have been triggered by the beacon. Are we allowing dreams into evidence now? How can I defend my innocence against this kind of testimony? I agree. Our judgment must be based on facts and evidence, not wild imaginings and reckless speculation. So, with our motion to have Saren stripped of his status shot down, it's back to the drawing board. A few ideas get floated and then it's off to build a case. You know, the thing we probably should have done the first time around. I guess humans stopped having a need for lawyers or something between the 21st and 22nd century because this was a pretty amateur display. Shepard starts his own investigation, hooking up with my boy Garrus who ends up joining the party and booting off Caden. Then down at CSEC headquarters they pick up Rex who boots off Ashley and now we got this squad assembled. They head over to Cora's Den, the local titty bar where dirt gets done and the three of them blast their way to Fist, who sent a young Corian with some evidence incriminating Saren back to the rogue Spectre as a business exchange. But when she shows up, it'll be Saren's men waiting for her. Tell me where that meeting is before I blow your lying head off. Here on the wards, the back alley by the markets. She's supposed to meet them right now. You can make it if you hurry. What are you doing? The Shadow Broker paid me to kill him. I don't leave jobs half done. A lot of people died because of him. He had it coming. Now let's move. We have to save that quarry. With Fist having met the business end of Rex's shotgun, the squad heads down the hall to the ambush point where they are able to rescue Tali before Saren's goons are able to take her out and steal the evidence off of her. Then it's back to Udina's office where they deliberate over what the hell is even going on. The recording Tali was able to pull off a Geth soldier has the Spectre copping up to the whole mess back on Eden Prime, calling it a major victory, bringing them one step closer to finding the conduit, while his busty old Asari partner in war crimes adds that it's also one step closer to the return of the Reapers. According to some data Tali pulled off the Geth, the Reapers are an ancient machine race that wiped out the Protheans, and that's probably what Shepard's vision was, the slaughter of the Protheans at the hands of the Reapers. So apparently Saren is looking to bring these murder bots back, and he needs something called the Conduit in order to do it. With actual somewhat credible evidence to back up their accusations, the humans return to the Council for round two, who end up agreeing that this evidence is in fact irrefutable. I mean, considering we got deepfakes in 2021, I wouldn't really go so far as to call this irrefutable, but okay, yeah, let's go with that. They judge Saren guilty in conspicuous abstentia and strip him of his Spectre status while simultaneously elevating Shepard to the rank. The Turian counselor makes a stink about it, but in the end, democracy wins out, and they task Shepard with bringing Saren to justice by any means necessary. Captain Anderson quietly gets shit-canned, possibly taking the blame for the Eden Prime fiasco, allowing him to hand over command of the Normandy to his protege. 
the newly minted Spectre who needs his own ship after all the chase after Saren. He owns up to the story that he was supposed to be a Spectre himself, but explains how Saren sabotaged his chances, and that's why he was quick to side with the dock worker who implicated Saren from the get-go. Anderson reiterates the fact that Saren hates humans and has no problems committing war crimes to finish a mission. And this is meant to smooth over this little ethical wrinkle in an otherwise perfectly heroic character. But forget Saren, he's in the wind now. They know what he's after, and they got some fresh leads to point Shepard in the right direction. And with luck, they will be able to intercept Saren and foil his plans. But there's a lot that they just don't know, and getting answers is going to be a priority here. So, with some fresh leads, Shepard steps aboard the ship that is now firmly under his command, and it's time to stir the troops with a speech and get on the hunt. Listen up, Normandy. This is your commander speaking. We have our orders. Find Saren before he finds the conduit. And I refuse to let anything get in the way of that mission. The Council wants to ignore this. That's no surprise. They've never helped us in the past. No reason they'd start now. But we don't need their help. We can do this on our own. Wherever Saren goes, we'll follow. Wherever he searches for the Conduit, we'll be there. We will hunt him to the very ends of the galaxy and bring him down. None of the other species has the guts, grit, or balls to deal with this. So it's up to us. We're the only ones who can stop Saren. I swear to you all, we will stop him. Well said, Commander. Captain will be proud. Fancy speeches won't stop Saren from finding the Conduit. If we really want to make the captain proud, we better get this bird in the air. Be advised, we will be confirming identification on arrival. If confirmation cannot be established, your vessel will be impounded. This is an unscheduled arrival. I need your credentials. All you need to know is I have more credentials than you. They plan to be trouble, ma'am. I can't let you enter the port area without confirmation of your identity. Sergeant Sterling, secure their weapons. Don't try it. Nobody takes my weapon. Charge and lock! We are authorized to use lethal force. You have to the count of three to surrender your weapons. One, two, three... Captain Matsuo, stand down! We confirmed their identity. Spectres are authorized to carry weapons here, Captain. You may proceed, Spectre. I hope the rest of your visit will be less confrontational. Welcome to Novaria, a frozen blind spot of galactic law where corporations come to perform legally questionable research to gain the upper hand in the cutthroat game of interstellar business. It also happens to be my favorite of the three starting worlds we can visit, partly because the story and world building here is some of the best, and partly because there's some great Shepard lines. Someone pissing your security chief's coffee today? The squad meets Gianna Parsini at the gates, who apologizes for their security chief and invites them up to speak with the administrator. The administrator is... how do I put this? He's kind of a dick. You will excuse me if I don't stand up. I have no time to entertain refugees from that urban blight called Earth. Funny thing about humans, we're pretty loyal to our homeworld. My homeworld is clean. Poverty is non-existent. If you take some perverse pride in that overheated, acid-washed slum, that is your business. He stonewalls Shepard and tells him that, because of a blizzard, he can't go after Benezia, who was seen coming through the port recently to check on Saren's business interests at Peak 15. He dodges every question Shepard is able to throw at him until the Spectre is forced to back off and find another way. You've never worked in the corporate world, have you, Commander? You can't bludgeon through bureaucracy. I can bludgeon pretty hard. Talk to Lorik Keen. You should be able to find him at the hotel bar. Can't say more. Not within earshot of Mr. Analeas. Parsini gives Shepard a lead to secure a garage pass to leave the port, but there are in fact several ways to get a pass. He could just turn in a smuggler, or he could do the fun thing and get totally involved in the high stakes game of corporate politics and espionage. Chasing the latter, he heads up to the bar to meet with Laura Keen, a Turian whom I have an inexplicable fascination with. Keen is the manager of the local Synthetic Insights office, but he's currently under investigation for misconduct by the administrator. Turns out, Keen got evidence that the administrator was taking kickbacks, and so the Solarian turned the tables and has his crooked security hunting for the evidence. Keen will give Shepard his garage pass in exchange for that evidence, so it's up to the offices. 
However, there is one other... What is that charming human expression? Fly in the lotion? Violence against Mr. Analeas's thugs may be necessary. He has members of Han Shan's security team searching my offices. He's paying them under the table. Miss Matsuo is unaware of their outside employment. If he's paying them under the table, they're mercenaries. I can kill mercenaries. Excellent. Analeas is paying you to shake this place down. That makes you a criminal. I can kill criminals. You're bluffing. How do you rate your confidence in that? 90th percentile? Is a 10% chance of death acceptable? He ain't paying me enough to take on specters or alliance troops or whatever. How about this? You pretend you didn't see us, we'll pretend we didn't see you. I don't think you're supposed to be in here, Shepard. Do you plan on making me leave? Leave? You think I'm gonna let you walk out? Uh-uh. Analeas would throw you off world for what you did here. I won't. You know what we did to cop killers on my world? You're breaking the law for bribe money. You know what we do to dirty cops on my world? With evidence in hand, it's back to the bar to make a decision. Parsini approaches Shepard with some hard facts. She's actually an undercover agent for Novaria's internal affairs office, and she's been secretly investigating the administrator for a while now. Keen's evidence and his personal testimony would be the perfect headshot to bring the crook down and restore Novaria back to its usual, more tolerable levels of corruption. Now, Shepard could either turn the evidence to Keen and get his garage pass as originally agreed upon, or he can convince the Turian to testify for Parsini. Now that you have my property, you want to dictate how I use it. I have no interest in a public spectacle. Listen, I just saved you from a nasty prison shower scene. Exercise that corporate credit account. It is good to have all our cards on the table. I regret that you have a better hand. Or, Shepard could take all of this info and the evidence to the administrator for some, uh, interesting results. Your secretary is a plant for the executive board. Internal affairs, she said. Eh, that is good to know. Would you mind stepping outside? I'm afraid I will have to let Miss Parasini go. It can't wait. Your mind has not been fully on your duty to me. I don't understand, sir. I'm not losing this job. Analeas, if I don't report in, the board will figure it out. Put the weapon- I said I'm not losing this job! Secure the area! Keep everyone out of here, now! Yes, ma'am. What happened here, Commander Shepard? Gianna was investigating Analeas's corruption. She worked for the executive board. He panicked, called her in, shot wildly. Yeah, makes sense. He was always paranoid. Excuse me, Commander. The death of an executive must always be filed in triplicate. Down in the garage, the squad is ambushed by a group of Geth who'd been smuggled in through security by Benezia and her entourage. After dispatching them and having a few choice words with a guard, the squad mounts up in a convenient Mako and heads into the Great Blizzard beyond. The mountain road is crawling with even more Geth, so between catching glimpses of some sweet vistas, the squad sets to blowing the enemies clear off the mountainside. The squad storms the Peak 15 research facility, and after dropping a host of Saren's goons, a new enemy appears. What was that? Probably the breed of have a panic attack. Whatever the people here had been researching, things didn't turn out so well because the researchers are nowhere to be found and these giant bug creatures are crawling all over the place, especially the ventilation system. The squad is forced to make repairs on the facility and bring the virtual intelligence unit back online hoping for answers, but Shepard, lacking the proper security clearance to access privileged corporate secrets, gets little in the way of answers. But with the repairs made, the shuttle to the hot labs is operational again. 
Down in the labs, the squad finally makes contact with the survivors of the facility who have barricaded themselves and set up a defensive perimeter, where the security team are stuck doing round-the-clock watches for bug ambushes. The security team is clearly on edge, and that might have to do with the aforementioned ambushes and the fact that they are all being kept awake by combat drugs, but they are acting very suspicious. They give the squad access to the makeshift camp with the survivors set up in the labs behind their defenses, and Shepard gets to meet some of the unique characters in this bunch. What do you do here? Molecular genetics. I specialize in biotic enhanced allele specific hybridization. Think you could translate that into galactic? It's a genetic thing. Forget it. Tell me about yourself. I am Alestia Alice from the University of Arrhaeus. Is there anything in particular you want to know, or should I just spout random facts? No need to be so rude. You are interrupting my meditations. Precisely how rude must I be to convince you to leave? You seem less upset at this situation than the others. That is one of the virtues of the meditation you interrupted. Do you know Matriarch Venezia? Do you know President Huerta of Earth? I did not think so. Venezia passed through here. You didn't see her? I saw her. You asked if I knew her. I do not. What sort of work do you do here? I can't say. I signed a non-disclosure agreement. If we survive, I'd like to keep my job. The location is terrible, but the pay is better than any other commercial lab. Two things come out of these conversations. First, Shepard agrees to finding a cure the doctor needs to heal some staff who'd been exposed to a toxin in an accident. And second, one of the staff members informs the squad that they've been fighting Rachni this entire time. The second bit is pretty damn important because the Rachni were supposed to be extinct after the Krogan wiped their species out following the Rachni's attempted invasion of the galaxy. It turns out Binary Helix, the corporation running these labs, found a Rachni queen's egg in a derelict ship floating in space since the wars. Rather than doing the smart thing and destroying the egg or alerting the council, they decided to hatch the thing and carry out experiments to do the usual things big corporations try to do in these situations, such as raising a giant cloned bug army. So this seems to neatly explain why Saren was interested in this facility. But the Rachni were not cool with being turned into an army, and they all went nuts and broke out of containment, leading to the mess Shepard has stumbled into. And presumably Benezia is here to clean up the mess before word gets out about them cloning Rachni. With a much better picture of the situation, Shepard goes ahead and makes secure so we can get the doctor's pass to access the restricted parts of the facility where Benezia is probably hanging out. Your mission ends here, Shepard. We'll see about that, bitch. She's surrounded by Geth and pointing a gun at us. Shoot her! You're not as stupid as you look. With the cure delivered, Shepard gains access to the last part of the facility where he finally comes face to face with Benezia. She sticks her Asari commandos on the squad, but after fighting off a few waves, Benezia breaks quite literally. I expected better from Asari commandos. I will not betray him. You will. You... You must listen. Saren still whispers in my mind. I can fight his compulsions briefly, but the indoctrination is strong. Benezia, in her brief moment of clarity, is able to feed Shepard a lot of info about Saren. First things first, Saren's ship is able to exude a certain, uh influence over his followers, indoctrinating them into following his will more and more. Benezia wanted to help Saren find a peaceful path, but she ended up being indoctrinated and turned into his most critical henchman. He's searching for the conduit, and it turns out that the only way to access it is through the Mu Relay, which was lost centuries ago. Only the Rachni knew where that relay is, so Benezia came to Peak 15 to get those coordinates. She did manage to get them, but already sent the data to Saren. She gives Shepard the coordinates too, but she has no idea what system Saren is actually looking for, or really what the conduit even is. Her moment of clarity passes and she turns on the group once more, before finally being put down for good. Then it's just a question of what to do with the Rachni Queen.
This one serves as our voice. We cannot sing. Not in these low spaces. Your musics are colorless. Who am I speaking to here? We are the mother. We sing for those left behind. The children you thought silenced. We are Rachni. This is the first moral choice Shepard has to make as a specter, and it's a bit of a doozy. He's being forced to decide the fate of an entire species. The queen makes a desperate, heartfelt plea to Shepard, and this gives him pause to... Nah, I'm just kidding. He exterminates the bugs with a vengeance. This time, stay dead. We will not embrace the great silence. Rex really couldn't have said it any better. Millions died from the Rachni. Every other Rachni in this facility was also trying to kill him, his squad, and every other sentient species in this facility. He doesn't even know if the Queen would have turned on him had she not been locked in a giant mason jar. She claims her species was peaceful before the war, that her children just went crazy when they were separated from her. But she's talking through a possessed dead Asari and just fuck anything that can do that. But, um, maybe Garrus did have a point about telling the Council. Is this report accurate, Commander? You found Rachni on Navaria? Found them and wiped them out. Do you take pleasure from committing genocide, Shepard? Depends on the species, Turian. Commander, you are addressing a member of the Council. You will show the proper respect. I have a mission to complete. The mission must always come first. Just be aware that your actions can have far-reaching consequences. We'll be waiting for your next report, Commander. Oh well, Shepard figures they'll probably get over him having vanquished the worst threat to galactic peace since the Reapers. It's time to go to the colony of Ferris and see what problems he can permanently solve over there. Like I said earlier, Novaria is my favorite of the first three worlds we get access to after becoming a Spectre, and that's because it concentrates a lot of what I love about the first game by constructing on top of the foundation earlier world building had already established. Novaria can be seen as an extension of the Citadel's thematic place in the story. That is, the Citadel being the seat of galactic governance. If the Citadel makes the player feel like the Citadel government is omnipotent, then Novaria will make it seem impotent. Novaria is the perfect counterpoint to the argument that the whole system with the Citadel Council and all those ambassadors is perfect, which the Presidium seems to imply with its idyllic architecture and landscaping. We get to Novaria, which is a frozen rock on the edges of Citadel-controlled space, and the first thing they do is put guns in our faces and threaten to impound the Normandy because we just showed up and nobody except Spectres are allowed to just show up unannounced. That's because this place is meant to be the blind spot of the Citadel. That's its value. Why else would people be living here? It sucks living on Novaria. So that value had to be created. This sounds like a, well, no shit kind of observation, but bear in mind a ton of stories, especially in video games, don't really think to answer questions like, why do people actually live here? But that's a very important question to answer when a writer is trying to build a realistic, or really, I should say, believable world. People don't just live on a bunch of rafts in the middle of the Arctic Ocean in real life. And if the story the writers are trying to set up requires us to believe in the motivation-based actions of its characters, particularly its antagonists and protagonists, then it helps to extend that motivation-based decision-making logic to the world. It makes the story as a whole more consistent, and consistency is the key to building a gripping narrative. Novaria is Mass Effect's consistency. It's the logical result of galactic laws that prohibit certain types of research. 
and those laws exist because of the unique histories of different races and governments that exist in this galaxy. This of course puts Noveria at odds with Citadel laws, but plays well to the motivations of the corporations operating in Citadel space. Once again, we are getting world building that is not at all arbitrary. Of course this place would exist, and of course this is how it would behave. And this is the perfect place to send Shepard, both from a story perspective and a gameplay perspective. Because there's only so many times you can go and defend an innocent colony. If you want to feel like a badass space cop, then you gotta be doing actual investigative work. What better place to investigate than the place that's meant to be the blind spot of galactic law? This naturally puts Shepard at odds with just about everyone here, and oh dear, look at that. We got a conflict that just wrote itself thanks to careful and consistent world building. Businesses come here to avoid the second guessing of galactic law. And I represent the second guessing of galactic law. Just so we understand each other. I will not allow you to harass our clients. This world is private property. What's interesting, but also more than a little disappointing, is how Novaria hints at diplomatic solutions to problems in this game. We could just get dirt on the smuggler in order to earn a pass out of Port Hanshan, or work with Laura Keen, but that solution involves violence and potentially some charismatic skills. When I think Spectres, this is what I imagined it would have been like, weighing options and trying to find solutions that optimally aligns with our goals. But this ends up being more of a mirage, as most other missions in this game lack diplomatic solutions or even multiple solutions in general. And what little of it existed in this game will practically go extinct in the second and third game. The lack of smaller decision making really hurts the illusion of choice Bioware was so carefully trying to construct in this series. Because we get so used to being put on rails or making a choice that just gives us slightly different dialogue that when a moment to make a choice does come up, it sticks out like a sore thumb and just seems blatantly artificial. And this is one of the hotter takes I'll be making in this video. I just don't really care for the big moral choices in this series. Mass Effect 1 handled them the best, I feel, but even in this game, we got some moments where we are forced to choose, and because of the lack of choice I've had in the gameplay segments earlier, I just see these scenarios as just another fake choice segment. Nothing comes to mind better than the decision to free or kill the Rachni Queen. Like, under no circumstances if I was Shepard, whether I'm a dick or a saint, am I going to make a choice about an entire species that I barely know anything about? I would have done exactly what Garrus suggests and just tell the fucking council that, hey guys, remember the Rachni? Uh, turns out they aren't extinct anymore, you might want to come and check this out. Considering humans probably hadn't even discovered electricity when the galaxy was getting wrecked by the brood swarm, it seems extremely irresponsible for Shepard to make this decision, especially when he's flanked by two species who are much more informed and qualified. It's not even like it would have been hard to have the third neutral let the council decide option. Bioware would have just needed to write in some little blurb on an elevator ride later that says, the Queen escaped Citadel captivity if they wanted her living to be the canon outcome, or the Queen died in Citadel captivity if they wanted her death to be canon. Had we been given just that one tiny third option, Novaria would have been that much better of a planet because then its big decision would have had as much consistency as all the other little decisions we have made up until this point. But like I said, Novaria is an anomaly of sorts in this game and the franchise as a whole. A glimpse at what these games really could have been if Bioware had been willing and or able to commit to more consistent decision making. Fortunately, they did commit more to the level of world building Novaria demonstrated, at least in the first game, and so even if my choices felt blunted, the thoughtfully built world kept me incredibly engaged. But we aren't quite done yet getting involved with shady corporations doing shady things because now we got a corporate-sponsored startup colony to save. Unlike Novaria, the people on Ferris are relieved to have Shepard arriving, because as the man on the docks expertly demonstrates, things at the colony are not going so well. The Geth are attacking, and nobody knows why. Shepard makes it up to the port city of Zeus Hope that is acting as a refugee camp following the devastating surprise Geth invasion. He makes contact with Phi Dan, the leader of the colony, who asks Shepard to clear out the nearby nest of Geth troopers and the beacon they are using to draw more troops to the area. 
Already an expert on killing Gath, Shepard and the squad quickly eliminate the problem and Fidan is able to breathe a little easier. He explains the Geth showed up recently and just started killing people across the colony. They are now mostly concentrated around the Exogeny headquarters across the Sky Bridge. Exogeny is funding this colony that's built upon the ruins of an ancient Prothean city and are having the colonists dig up any relics they can find. Fidan dispels the obvious reason for why the Geth are attacking. They haven't found anything useful from the ruins. Regardless, Shepard doubts the Geth are just attacking human colonies at random. That isn't exactly their MO. He figures there's more satisfying answers at the headquarters. Before he goes, he lends a helping hand to the refugees. This just involves securing food, energy, water, and some more security for the people. It also has him running into this guy. You don't want to go down there. You're not stopping me. Maybe I will stop you. How would you like that? No! Ah! That was a good one. Very intense. What's the matter with you? Just invoking the Master's whip. Helps remind me I'm still alive. You're here for the Geth, aren't you? You're not the only one interested in those things. Who else is looking for the Geth? Not looking for looking to get rid of. They're a thorn in the side of the- ah! I'm trying to get to the- Dying! <laughs> Let's go. He can't help us. Maybe I should just put him out of his misery. I've thought about that several times. I'd rather die fighting. I could help you if you told me what you're fighting. Not that kind of fight. It's like running through a thorn bush. The more you struggle... Time's up. Company's coming. Ask my dad. Ask him about the- ah! After chatting with him and some of the other colonists, Shepard begins to notice these people are acting a little, uh, funny. More than your standard PTSD. He asks Fi Dan, but he gets oddly cagey, so Shepard decides it's probably about time to move on. While making their way across the Sky Bridge system, the squad comes in contact with another group of survivors who weren't aware Fi Dan and Zeus Hope is still standing. These people got problems of their own, and that's where Shepard can help. Most notably, Juliana asks for Shepard to keep an eye out for her daughter, whom she was separated from when the attacks hit. He promises everyone he'll do his best, and then it's back to the Mako. Fortunately for everyone involved, Shepard just stumbles upon her daughter, Lisbeth, as they were combing through the ruins of the Exogeny headquarters. She was one of the researchers here, and she lets on that she's aware of what the Geth are after, but implores Shepard to take care of the remaining Geth and the giant Geth ship that has latched itself to the headquarters building. If they can find a way to dislodge the ship, maybe they will be able to get rid of Geth and their defensive barriers. Well, it seems as good of a plan as any, so the team heads deeper into the building. I am unable to comply. Please contact your supervisor. Damn it! Tell me what I want or I'll blast your virtual ass into actual dust! Please contact your supervisor for a level 4 security exemption, or make an appointment with- STUPID MACHINE! If there is nothing else, please step aside. There is a queue forming behind you for the use of this console. Exogeny Corporation reminds all staff that the discharging of weapons while on company property is strictly forbidden. So, Lisbeth absolutely knew what was going on here. Exogeny did find something here. The Thorian is some sort of ancient plant life that stretches across the entire planet and releases spores that can control the minds of anyone who inhales them. A major sample of it was located directly beneath Zeus Hope, and the people there were unknowingly exposed to the spores and studied. The Thorian seems to be careful, gentle even, with whom it infects, and relies on those servants to tend to its needs when it needs them, but it's careful to keep its existence a secret. A sentient plant with mind control capabilities seems like something Saren and the Geth would be interested in, so that explains that. After knocking the Geth ship off the building using some old-fashioned ingenuity, Shepard confronts Lisbeth. She's insistent that she wanted to stop the experiments, even trying to report Exogeny, but they threatened her and placed her under administrative watch. 
And this all checks out with what they found with the VI, so at least her story is consistent. But that still doesn't solve their latest problem. What to do about the Thorian. Something like this seems too dangerous to keep around, and with the Geth and Saren now interested, it seems likely they will have to destroy this thing. Back at the little survivor camp, Lisbeth and Juliana are reunited, and everyone is made aware of the Thorian's existence. Shepard insists he's gotta get rid of this thing, but Lisbeth warns him that the people of Zeus Hope won't let him get near it. They'd sooner die than let him harm the Thorian. Juliana offers a solution as opposed to just gunning down the people, a concentrated nerve agent that will neutralize the colonists without killing them. Shepard just has to slap it on his grenades and let kinetics do the rest. Back at Zeus Hope, the team runs into these creepy zombie things that are advanced tenders to the Thorian. But using the grenades and some bullets, they are able to make their way to the tunnel entrance where Fidan is waiting. Rather than shooting at Shepard, which admittedly wouldn't have done anything anyway, he instead defies the will of his master and kills himself. And finally, they come face to face with the Thorian at last. And, well... Alright, we just need to find this creature and determine what it... What it is. This was not covered by my training manuals. Nothing's ever simple, is it? Invaders, your every step is a transgression. A thousand feelers appraise you as meat, good only to dig or decompose. I speak for the old growth as I did for Saren. You are within and before the Thorian. It commands that you be in awe. You enslaved the colonists. You destroyed their minds. I don't know what Saren wanted with you, but I just want you dead. The Thorian is a piece of this world. Extending across the land and back through the ages. You can no more kill it than cut the sky. Your blood will feed the ground and the new growth! The squad battles with the creepers and that Asari clone, making their way farther up the chamber as they shoot at the tentacle bundles that are holding it in place. At the top, they clip the last bundle and the Thorian loses its grip and falls deep into the chamber, presumably dying on impact. Then the original Asari all those clones had been copied from bursts out of a giant wart on the wall and is surprisingly forthcoming with a lot of information. Forget the mind control spores and all that nonsense, Saren, as Shepard already knows, possesses a ship that does all that and better. Like the Rachni, what he was really aiming for was what the creature knew, and it turns out that the Thorian knew a lot. When the Reapers came and wiped out all the Protheans, the Thorian absorbed the dead and they became a part of it. All their knowledge, history, language, the very essence of what being a Prothean was, was absorbed by the planet-spanning plan. Turns out that information is very useful for understanding Prothean beacon messages, because those messages were programmed for Prothean minds to understand. Most people would have just gone insane from that experience, but Shepard is pretty badass and was able to just walk away from the experience with nothing but a garbled vision. Well, the Asari, her name is Shiala by the way, was able to extract that information, known as the Cypher, and transfer it to Saren's mind so that he too could understand implicitly the messages from the Beacons. Then he gave her up to the Thorian as tribute, and then ordered his Geth to kill the Thorian, as a means to cover his track. So maybe killing it was a bit rash, the enemy of my enemy and all that, but it's a little bit too late to be worrying about that. The good news is Shiala is able to do the same thing and give Shepard the Cypher, which she does. She's not able to give him anything else, or at least nothing that he doesn't already know, but she was very helpful. So when she asks if she could stay with the people of Zeus Hope and help them rebuild, eh, Shepard figures they're probably even for her clones trying to kill him and agrees to let her atone in her own noble way. Back on board the Normandy, the Council is really displeased he committed yet another act of reckless extermination. Commander, Exogen, you should have told us about the Thorian. It would have made your job much easier. You might have been able to capture it for study instead of destroying it. The only reason to study a creature like that is to figure out how to kill it. Yes, kill it. 
That's how you humans usually deal with things you don't understand. Goodbye, Canceller. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. We lost that connection. Despite their constant heel dragging, the Council does finally come through with a very solid lead. The Salarian Counselor informed Shepard that a Salarian recon team had been sent to Vermeyer chasing leads about Saren. What they found was his base of operations, but after that report they stopped checking in, and the Counselor is now concerned. He tips Shepard off, knowing how critical any solid leads on Saren are for his mission, and wishes him luck in finding anything of use out there. Seeing the enormous potential the base of Saren's operations could be for his mission, Shepard makes it an immediate priority and orders the Normandy to go check it out. They're able to zero in on the base and the Salarian Recon Group's camp, so Joker drops a squad in the Mako at a reasonable distance from the camp. They fight their way through several Geth outposts until finally arriving at the camp where he learns of a very serious development. While they were able to make a spectacular drop behind enemy lines, the Normandy is now victim to the base's extensive anti-air defenses and its broadcast jamming. This was the exact fate that befell the Maroon Salarians, which was why they couldn't escape or send out a proper long-distance message. The Salarian captain recommends the Normandy and its crew just sit tight and wait on reinforcements they requested, but when he finds out the Normandy was the reinforcements, he realizes they need a change of plans. He begins sharing what him and his team have managed to piece together since arriving on Vermeyer. They did find Saren's base of operations, which is in fact a Krogan breeding facility. Rex's ears perk up from this, and he comes over to find out how that's even possible. You know, since they've been infected with a sterility plague during their rebellion against the council many years back. It turns out Saren's researchers have found a cure for it and are now able to mass breed and clone Krogans, which he is turning into an army. The Geth are bad enough, but with an army of Krogan, he definitely could take over the galaxy. Rex is not at all happy with the plan to destroy the base and its research, as the Genophage has been slowly killing his species for some time, and nobody has tried to reverse it or its effects, according to Rex anyhow. Shepard has to calm the giant dinosaur down, but thanks to Shepard and Rex being such good buddies, more on that a little later, Rex agrees to stand down. No, we were tools for the Council once. To thank us for wiping out the Rachni, they neutered us all. I doubt Saren will be as generous. All right, Shepard, you've made your point. I don't like this, but I trust you enough to follow your lead. Just one thing, when we find Saren, I want his head. With the walking tank soothed, the team concocts a plan to infiltrate Saren's base and nuke it to hell using an improvised bomb constructed from the drive of the Salarian's ship. The plan is going to involve some serious coordination between the Salarians, who are going to act as a distraction by attacking the facility en masse, and Shepard's shadow team that will infiltrate under the cover provided by the Salarians. Ashley goes along with the Salarians to maintain communications between the two teams. Once the details are settled, the captain delivers a stirring little speech to his troops, and everyone heads off to execute the admittedly somewhat desperate plan. With the Salarians on the offensive, Shadow Team slips in at the back of the base and begins cutting a path to the main facility. Along the way, they spot and sabotage systems that will buy the Salarian teams more time, and they do manage to kill a lot of Geth and Krogan too. Once inside the main facility, Shepard is free to do some poking around, and they come across some interesting folk. These parents, I don't know what for. The effect of incessant whispering on my shortening temper. Who knows? I just need out. Something's not right here, Shepard. He's not part of the mission. No. No. I, I need to get out. This room is too small, and it keeps talking, and I really want to get out of here and get some work done. I need to get out. Let me out. I can't take that chance. Can't take that chance. No chance. I need to do what it says. I have to. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. There's nothing left of them. No, oh, this is no way to treat a prisoner. Kill them, sure, but don't leave them like this. Better to die than to live like this. 
I've never agreed more, Shepard. It's what I would want. So, it turns out this isn't just a Krogan breeding facility. Saren is into all sorts of research here, especially neuroscience. He's concerned about his ship's sovereign and its indoctrination effects. Up until this point, everyone just assumed Saren was the one controlling the energy field that warps people's minds and weakens their willpower, making them more susceptible to manipulation. It turns out Saren doesn't control it. The ship does it on its own. Okay? And Saren is afraid that is affecting him now. If Saren isn't the one calling the shots, who the hell is? I'm gonna blow this place to hell and gone. If you want to make it out alive, you better start running. What? You can't. But I'll never. Ah! You enjoyed that, Commander. The squad gets access to Saren's private chambers, and housed within it is yet another Prothean beacon. Shepard is able to pull a similar message off of this one, and then things finally start to come together. I get the feeling something bad is about to happen. You are not Saren. What is that? Some kind of VI interface? Rudimentary creatures of blood and flesh. You touch my mind, fumbling in ignorance, incapable of understanding. I don't think this is a VI. There is a realm of existence so far beyond your own, you cannot even imagine it. I am beyond your comprehension. I am Sovereign. Sovereign isn't just some Reaper ship Saren found. It's an actual Reaper. Reaper, a label created by the Protheans to give voice to their destruction. In the end, what they chose to call us is irrelevant. We simply are. Alright, so, well, at least we know who's the one pulling all the strings now. Sovereign and his Reaper Ilk harbor some serious disdain for organic life, calling it a mistake and basically gloating every which way about how all advanced life in the galaxy will be coming to an end, just as the Protheans were vanquished and countless other species before them. The Protheans didn't invent interstellar travel, they didn't build the mass relays or the Citadel. The Reapers were responsible for all of that. In doing this, galactic societies would develop along limited paths that the Reapers knew and could control, making the harvest much easier for them. The all-important why is left unanswered by the Vanguard Reaper, but Shepard has given many answers to the questions he's been chasing for a while now. But with Sovereign bored of answering Shepard's inconsequential questions, it cuts the conversation off and starts making its way towards the facility, and that spells trouble for Shepard and the Salarians. So with a renewed vigor, they plot their escape, but Geth reinforcements have finally caught up with the Salarians. Shepard is faced with one of his biggest choices yet. Head to the bomb site and rescue Caden who is arming the bomb and will defend it until it detonates, or rescue Ashley, who is making a last stand with the Salarians on the other end of the base. In the end, Shepard chooses Ashley, mostly for personal reasons that will become apparent in a bit. This takes him straight into a direct confrontation with Saren, who comes surfing in on a one-of-a-kind hoverboard. After a pitched battle, Saren and Shepard get to talk one-on-one, -on -one, and Saren is able to explain his side in all of this. It quickly becomes clear that, as Shepard has been suspecting, Saren isn't the one running any of this. He's just Sovereign's greatest and most visible pawn. He's completely lost himself to the Reapers, maybe even fully indoctrinated at this point, and Saren is mostly in denial. Saren's hopes rest in a sort of loophole he believes exists for himself and any other organics who prove themselves useful to the Reapers. He hopes that in doing this, he can convince the Reapers to spare the galaxy this time around. But recognizing that he might already be indoctrinated, he had the Vermeer facility built to study its effects, and is convinced that, no, his mind is still his own. Shepard isn't convinced though, saying he'd rather die fighting than live as a slave for the machines. Saren believes that sort of thinking is why everyone in the galaxy will be doomed to die, because if the Protheans couldn't stop them, then, well, really, what chance do they have? Talking time comes to an end and shooting begins again, only interrupted by the bomb very loudly announcing to everyone in the base that it is about to detonate. So Saren skips on out as the Normandy comes swooping in. 
The survivors hop aboard and make it to orbit just in time to escape the massive nuclear blast, leaving Caden down there to be incinerated. They manage to save everyone else, including the Solarian captain and his team, so I at least says that. Vermeer is much more action-packed, and there's very little in the way of actual world-building, but in that place, we do get some worthwhile plot and character development. The greatest revelation of all up until this point is no doubt Sovereign not being Saren's ship, but an actual Reaper. That alone would have been enough, but Bioware takes it a step further by having Sovereign itself explain that to the player in one of my favorite conversations in the franchise. Even now, years and many, many playthroughs later, there are still points in that conversation that make the hair on my neck stand up. It's just a very well executed reveal that had just enough foreshadowing that, in hindsight, you go, oh, well, that actually explains quite a few things. Really, Vermeer is used to put some faces and motives to our antagonists, because we finally get to confront Saren, ignoring the tiny exchange we got during the very first council meeting. Bioware begins to cast Saren in a more tragic, misguided antagonist role, as opposed to a mustache-twirling villain. Uh, yeah, he's committing all these atrocities, but he's doing it to save the rest of the galaxy and uphold his sworn duty as a Spectre. As seeing as Spectres are entrusted with near-unlimited authority, it's not like he's way out of bounds or anything. And just the same, Shepard can make similar questionable choices for the sake of his mission. There's nothing in the extended lore outside of the games that contradicts this either, so it seems like Saren truly believed he was doing the right thing. He just got indoctrinated despite his best attempts to understand and avoid it. In the end, he just became another tool for the Reapers, just as Benezia had. And if these mentally and emotionally powerful individuals felt easy prey to the Reapers, what hope is there for anyone else? But this is all mostly plot development. We also get a lot of character development that's meant to ante up the stakes we the players have in the story, mostly by forcing us to sacrifice one of our crew members. I've already complained about what feels like contrived moral decisions back on Novaria, but this one I've always felt to be the most egregious, just because I really don't care about Caden or Ashley. We haven't gotten to look at the squad mates just yet because we still gotta get Liara, but I'm of the same mind as almost every other person who has played this game. The human companions in this game are, well, they're just dull. So when I'm forced to choose between them, it's more often just some kind of mental coin toss. Unless I'm romancing one of them. People like to talk about which one they sacrifice, and I just go, I wish I could have dumped both of them. There's no higher moral dilemma to this choice. It's not like, oh, if I save Ashley, everyone else is going to die. But if I save Caden, I can kill Saren, sort of deal. It's literally just which bland character am I role-playing as disliking less this playthrough. All the other major choices had some sort of moral dimension to it, this one is just pure vanity. But it's a brief point at the end of the mission and doesn't really take away from everything else Vermeer does well, which is answering questions and spawning more, and putting a lot more urgency into his story that has, despite sounding very dire, hasn't actually seemed that desperate since Eden Prime. We've been fighting small bands of Geth and other enemies, but those missions all felt self-contained and didn't do a lot to make the world feel in danger. Vermeer changes that dynamic and really starts to tighten up the narrative, giving it just the right amount of push needed to get us through the second half of the game. So Shepard and company now know most of what's going on. The Reapers are an advanced machine race that periodically harvest all life in the galaxy, and were the true cause for the Prothean extinction. The Protheans didn't build the relays or the Citadel, the Reapers did that to control the development of organic races for easier harvesting. Saren is trying to bring the Reapers back in order to pledge fealty to the homicidal machines, starting with Sovereign, who's not a Geth ship but an actual Reaper with mind control abilities. The return of the Reapers is linked to something called the Conduit, but they don't know what that is or where it is, except that they need the Mew Relay to access it. They got most of the puzzle assembled, but they are missing a few key pieces, especially the pieces involving the Protheans. 
The only lead they have left is Liara to Sony, Benezia's daughter who also happens to be an expert on the Protheans. Even though Benezia is gone, Liara might still have some use that can help them solve this entire thing. She was last seen on Therum studying some Prothean ruins that had been excavated there, so that's where the Normandy heads to next. They land on the volcanic planet in the Mako and fight their way through some Geth. They reach the mines and fight through some more Geth. They meet up with Liara who is experiencing some uh, effects from being left in the ruins for a while and maybe they should have rescued her a bit sooner. Are you... are you real? Oh no, don't be stupid Liara. Humans do not come here, you're hallucinating. And talking to yourself. <laughs> oh goddess, I am going to die here. We're here to save your sorry ass, so snap out of it. You're rude for a hallucination. My subconscious must want to punish me for being this stupid. My name is Shepard. The Office of Special Tactics and Recon sent me. <sighs> a specter? <laughs> That's good. What else would I conjure up? A protector figure, yes. Perfect. Comforting. Well, I'll play along. As you can see, I am trapped here. If you're as real as you claim, find a way to get me out. How'd you end up in there? Ah, yes, the figment of my imagination wants me to retrace my steps. See if I can figure out where I went wrong. I was exploring the ruins. When the Geth showed up, I ran in here and activated the defenses. The barrier curtains could protect me. When I turned it on, I must have hit something I wasn't supposed to. I was trapped in here. You must get me out, please. Any suggestions on how we can help? Of course. What good is a hallucination if it can't offer false hope? Listen, if you're real, find some way past the barrier curtain. Find some way to deal with the Geth. Then use the control panel to release me. If you're not real, leave me alone. I'm tired of talking to myself. Now I am hallucinating that you are inside the tower. I must be getting worse. Earlier I even imagined I heard thunder. We used the mining laser to bore through. You bored through? <gasps> you're real, aren't you? By the goddess, you're real! Uh, I'm sorry, I, I thought you were a hallucination. I thought I was going mad. Please get me out of here before more Geth show up. But with her secured, you won't guess what they do next. They fight more Geth. We don't have time to deal with this idiot. Charge! <sighs> I like your attitude. They make it back to the Normandy, and Liara proceeds to get her mind blown by this crew that unexpectedly swooped in and rescued her. They were wiped out by the Reapers, a race of sentient machines. The... the Reapers? But I have never heard of... How do you know this? What evidence do you have? There was a damaged Prothean beacon on Eden Prime. It burned a vision into my brain. I'm still trying to sort out what it all means. Not to mention your little run-in with Sovereign. I'd call that definitive proof. And then there's the Cypher. I'm not sure what that other Asari did to you, but she did something. Sovereign? The Cypher? A, a Prothean beacon? I I'm sorry, this is all a bit overwhelming. I just... I need a moment to... collect myself. I have spent most of my adult life investigating the Prothean extinction. Decades of intense academic study and field research. And for what? I never thought it would end like this. You show up and tell me all the answers just fell into your lap. It isn't fair. All those years, wasted. There's a rogue specter out there looking to destroy the galaxy. So quit whining and help me stop him, or I'll drop your ass back in that volcano. I... I am sorry, Commander. I don't know what came over me. You are right, of course. We have to stop Saren. That is all that really matters. You said you have visions. From the Beacon. Let me join my consciousness to yours. Maybe my knowledge of the Protheans can help clarify this vision. Make it fast. Time's a-wasted. With Shepard now knowing the conduit is on Ilos, he's able to make a plea to the Council, and despite their contentious working relationship, they are surprisingly receptive to his arguments and encourage him to head back to the Citadel to discuss their next moves. Speaking of next moves, there's almost nothing worth talking about when it comes to Therum. It was an incomplete mission world that Bioware had big plans for, but never got to implement them. The only worthwhile thing here is getting Liar, and seeing as we now finally have the full team introduced, it's time to take a break from chronological storytelling to take a long look at characters and side quests.
When we're not following Saren's footsteps in the main story trying to puzzle together the mystery of the Reapers, we're usually engaged with companion stories and side missions. These two aspects of the game I feel could have used more time and polish, especially the side missions that have us landing on planets, but we'll get back to those in just a second. First, I want to start by looking at the companions, because I feel Bioware only narrowly missed a target on this one. What held this aspect back from its true greatness was merely how it was presented and utilized. I don't have a problem with any of the companions, I couldn't really sit here and say there's a bad character in the bunch. Just certain companions seem to have gotten more time and attention than others, and that bias bleeds into the finished product with some unfortunate consequences. As well, the player starts to experience a distortion in their perception due to how the game presents its characters on the ship and out in the field, and the gamey feel of assembling a squad ultimately stymies the opportunity for the player to enjoy the company of other companions. We have six different companions whom we can take out on missions with us, but they are so rarely given opportunities to demonstrate their individual personalities. Take Caden for instance. We meet Caden at the very beginning when he's shooting the shit with Joker. This is an excellent way to demonstrate a character's personality by showing them in their natural environment. We don't need a third opinion to narrate to us that Caden is a very no-nonsense career military guy. We see it and understand it in about a minute of dialogue. While Mass Effect never really drops the ball by resorting to telling not showing writing, they miss the mark on how frequently these sorts of conversations show up in direct dialogue. I can only think of maybe a handful of conversations in the story where our companions play a critical role in how that conversation plays out, which then gives us a serious look into what those characters are about. The rest of the time we are reliant on crew conversations below deck and the very infrequent banter out on missions. The problem really becomes apparent when I'm encouraged from a gameplay perspective to stick to Garrison Rex as my shore party because they have the best gear and stats to complement my own Shepard's combat abilities. Like, they got this chart at the bottom of the screen, and it's wise to keep the humors of combat in balance lest we stumble into a combat scenario where we've got three biotic heavy characters and all the enemies are resistant to biotic powers. But because a large portion of the character building is done when out on missions and on elevators, we end up feeling like our preferred two squad mates are the only ones with any serious personality and development. Frankly, I don't really know how Bioware can encourage more experimentation and variety in squad mate usage from a combat perspective, but I do believe there are plenty of ways to allow the characters a chance to shine more when not in the field. The first and most obvious thing is having more conversations below deck. These one-on-one -on -one conversations are second to none when it comes to showing us what these characters are about but this game really handled them haphazardly. Rex's conversations are all perfectly executed. There's a fantastic balance between Rex educating us about the Krogan and all the promises people face, while also giving us plenty of backstory about him. We learn about his career as a mercenary, his issues with his family, and his eventual disenfranchisement with the Krogan entirely. All of this is expertly balanced and paced out so that Rex doesn't feel like he just exists solely to teach Shepard about the Krogan. To top it all off, his delivery of these stories is engaging and displays his personal characteristics. The only problem is that there's only like four of them and they are roadblocked by main story missions. To look at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we got Tali who got so badly mishandled in this game. She has tremendous potential, but her off the record chats are so dull. We learn painfully little about her except that she really loves her people and is quite homesick while traveling on the Normandy. We learn a ton about the Quarians and the Geth, but we barely get anything about her at all. And that's almost criminal because if we take her on missions, she will sometimes deliver some great witty remarks that hint at a fantastic character hiding under that suit. But the best we can really say about her is that she's a homesick girl who likes spaceships. Now that we got the broadest range of this admittedly arbitrary spectrum of mine established, we can begin plotting the other four squad mates on it. Garrus, I feel, lands closer to Rex in that we get to really know how he feels about authority and institutions from the very first scene. He's brash, hot-headed, idealistic, but he's loyal and almost too committed to the greater good, which has his moral compass seeming a little out of whack. He wishes he could have been a specter rather than a C-Sec grunt. 
Not because he wants power and status, but because he feels he'd be able to do the most good if he didn't have his hands tied behind his back all the time by regulation. And you see all of this I can say about Garrus just based off the few cutscenes he's in and the brief chats we get down in the hangar. I don't want to keep going through all the companions this way because this isn't really a review of each character. Like I said, I don't think there's really a bad character in the bunch. Some got more going on than others, and some were handled better than others, but that's no fault for the characters themselves. And they all can be enjoyed on some level. It's just, if you want to be a Tali or Liara fan, you're gonna have your work cut out for you, because they just aren't given their proper screen time dues. I do have to talk about Ashley though because I opted to romance her in this game because I couldn't go with Liara because in order to threaten to drop her in a volcano, I had to leave her until the very last story mission. Ashley's got some, uh, borderline traits. I can't tell the aliens from the animals. Hmm. Oh, they've built themselves quite the lake. Wonder if anyone ever drowned in it. I've seen people argue she's not really racist in this game, but people who claim that probably never heard this line before. Anywho, that unpleasantness aside, and the fact that she directly calls out my boys Rex and Garrus, Ashley has a really strange issue in that the writers kind of gave her too much screen time, at least below deck. She has so much to say about her family, her political and religious beliefs, her interest in poetry, and she will just bury Shepard in a deluge of personal information with hardly any prompting. And Shepard can then likewise respond with equal amounts of personal information. I don't think any of the other companions can really elicit much personal backstory from Shepard. But with Ashley, we can tell her how we like or don't like poetry, or how we are or aren't religious, or even how we like or don't like her in general. Ashley got a disproportionate amount of screen time, and I imagine that's one of the reasons she's so universally disliked by players. Not only does she disparage their favorite alien companions, she also bumps them from the stage so she can talk about her sisters and quote poetry. While the other companions needed more conversations to be able to give us more, Ashley needed more conversations just to pace her out. There's nothing wrong with her having this much going on, but in comparison to the others on the ship, she comes across as a self-absorbed chatterbox. Once again, nothing particularly wrong with her as a character, aside from the xenophobia. She was just sloppily handled by the writers. I guess we should go over romance in this game because it's a thing people feel really strongly about. I never felt one way or another about it in any of the games, but especially in the first one, I'm very indifferent to it. I don't sit there thinking of which crew member I'd want to date in real life, or think of headcanon romantic relationships between Shepard or their crewmates. I find the cutscenes and the flirting to be unintentionally funny at best and uncomfortable at worst, backed up by the fact that I can go from literally insulting Ashley all the way through Eden Prime. Like you're disappointed I survived. I never want to see anything bad happen to a fellow Marine Commander. Let's just leave it at that. You have a problem with me, Chief? You questioned my competence through the entire mission. Best way to stop that is to show me you're competent. But I don't remember inviting you to come back to the ship with us. You didn't. Captain Anderson did. To having her in Shepard's bed in four conversations standing around the dim Normandy hangar. No dates, no romance, no nothing. And this is after she talks about how her and her sisters take things at their own pace and will send dudes to the hospital that want to go too fast. It's just impossible for me to take any of this even remotely seriously in this game. Liara's romancing arc is no bargain either. I mean, the considered proper way, because the game mentions it several times, is to rescue Liara and then confront her mother with her and the squad which results in you forcing her to gun down her own mother and watch her die after suffering a psychotic break because of the indoctrination. And then she starts flirting with Shepard because of their connection to the Protheans and telling Shepard how she's barely more than a child in the sorry years and all of this just seems just really weird and creepy. Once again, no dates, you just chat in her closet lab at the back of the med bay until she gives you the green light. I don't actually know how a romance with Kanan goes, because if I did it, it was probably only once years ago, so I don't remember. 
Maybe that one makes Shepard not seem as predatory. This is also ignoring the fact that Shepard is everyone's boss and there's supposed to be rules against that sort of thing. Like, I doubt this came from a negative place. Shepard isn't meant to seem creepy, especially Paragon Shepard. But due to the infrequent conversations, it's all rushed so much that the illusion needed for me to buy into the romance fails to convince almost entirely. A lot of these issues I bring up with the companions does get addressed in Mass Effect 2. You're not so severely punished for bringing different squad members out on missions, there's more one-on-one -on -one chats, and each companion gets their own missions that allows us to really learn what they are about. Even in this game, none of my complaints truly hampers my enjoyment of the individual characters, but there are design faults that can subtly make companions seem worse than they are, and that's definitely worth noting. Saren is either a traitor or a madman. Taking him down will restore the good name of Turians everywhere. Glad to hear it. I was losing sleep over the prospect of people not loving the Turians. If you blast through the main story of Mass Effect, you can have the game done in 10 to 15 hours. If you decide to take your time and tackle the side missions and explore the Uncharted worlds, the game can hit 30 hours. But while those first 15 hours spent with the main story is pretty much Bioware RPG excellence, the second 15 hours with the side content is a very mixed bag. This is mostly because a lot of those side quests will take us to uncharted worlds and derelict ships where we are forced to interact with the unquestionably weaker combat and exploration components of the first game. In between trying to stop Saren, the Geth, and the Reapers, Shepard will frequently come across relatively less urgent problems when cruising through the galaxy. We will come across a lot of these missions, and quite frankly the more interesting ones, during our many trips to the Citadel. As a rule of thumb for this game, the more talking storytelling and world building a quest has, the more enjoyable it is. The more shooting, driving, and exploration it has, the worse it is. I haven't really discussed gameplay yet, because action in this game just isn't very good. This was Bioware's second major attempt at moving away from turn-based action and transitioning to real-time action, and it shows. If you're a game designer and fully half of your game is notably weaker than the other half, you're going to be limited with what you can present to your audience. But Bioware couldn't just go, you know what, the shooting sucks but we can still write a good story. Let's just cut out all the combat and double down on the writing. For starters, very few creators, writers especially, really know how well what they are making is going to resonate with an audience. This is why it's better to try and appeal to a certain range of potential audiences. It takes a very serious degree of foresight and some unreasonable levels of confidence to believe in the strengths of your creation enough to bet it all on those strengths. You throw in things you know will be weaker in hopes to at least supplement them. Secondly, Bioware would have kneecapped the story in the world they were trying to make by reducing or removing the frequency of action in this game. This is a story about stopping an army of killer robots and a power-hungry maniac in a turbulent and violent world where we are one of the primary peacekeepers. That premise demands some level of action. If everything can be solved with words, why don't the diplomats control everything? And I don't think any of us would have been satisfied by all the action occurring off camera. Anyway, to make a long point short, we gotta take the good with the bad in this game. As much as I would like to dive into as many side quests as I can in this video, I also would like to just, you know, not do that. To that end, we can really look at these side quests as falling into certain types or categories. First, we got conversation missions, which aren't even missions. It's just us completing a conversation. And usually to get the best outcome, we need some points in one of the dialogue skills. No challenge really at all with these, but they happen to be some of my favorite. While they don't contain any challenging gameplay, they usually present either morally challenging dilemmas, or some neat world or character building, or some entertaining dialogue, or all of that. Two missions of this sort take place on the Presidium at the Citadel. One has us mediating a heated argument between a pregnant mother and her brother-in-law. They go into the fact that her husband died from a rare genetic heart condition, and there's a chance the baby will also have that condition. The mother can have the child undergo genetic engineering in the womb to prevent it, but the mother is concerned about long-term side effects internet articles say people don't know yet. 
while the brother-in-law believes she should do it because the baby is all he has left of his brother. First, I like this because this could easily have just been some little entry into the codex stating how genetic modifications are now commonplace, but there's still people who are uncertain about them and whatever else. That's a fine way to handle subcreation in a video game, and I don't think anyone is going to be upset that they couldn't debate the moral issues of genetic modification in a game about shooting murder bots. But Bioware didn't settle on just relegating it to that role. They made a neat little hypothetical scenario where it lets the player learn about these things organically in a satisfying way, and then debate on it themselves. The player has a few options ranging from let her decide to <laughs> I'm not even getting involved in this. The game doesn't go so far as to let us piece together a compelling argument ourselves. If we got the required charm or intimidate skill points, Shepard makes the arguments themselves. But here is where Shepard exhibits their own character as opposed to simply acting as a blank avatar to enable every player choice remotely possible. And that's the second thing I really enjoy about these conversation missions. They let us further explore and develop who our Shepard is. Some of these conversations have a great deal of depth and choice, more so than most other conversations in the game. Bioware wanted to give us as much freedom as they could with these things to further the role-playing aspect of the game, and it works great. There's quite a few ways this specific conversation can play out depending upon if the player chooses to side with the mother or the brother-in-law, and then if they use a Paragon or a Renegade skill check to make their argument. I've done this mission a couple dozen times and I still find new lines I've never heard before from time to time. Nearby we got a C-Sec officer arguing with a Hanar Evangelical. And just like the arguing couple, this arguing pair gives another section of world building, showing how the council deals with competing religious views on the citadel and what the Hanar believes about the Protheans. Though really, I just love this one for the memorable lines. Why can't it act in an orderly and lawful manner? Because it's a big, stupid jellyfish. If you can't solve this problem, you don't even deserve to be in seasick. I didn't ask for your help, human. I can deal with this myself. You Hanar deserve what you get. You're either too snobbish or too stupid to follow simple rules. This one will obey. It does not wish to prejudice other species against the Hanar. I see the Hanar is left. Thank you. Somebody needed to set that thing straight, and it obviously wasn't going to be you. You have already demonstrated your ability. I acknowledge it, and I will learn from your example. Then we got shooting gallery missions, which are the polar opposite to the conversation missions. Barely any talking, aside from some dialogue or a galactic phone call from Alliance Command to give us the setup and the debriefing. These tend to be my least favorite because they focus on what I consider the weakest parts of the game. The best these ones can really do is give us an entertaining premise like the one that has us hunting down packs of space monkeys searching for a data module they stole from a crashed pro before they get to find it. It's really dumb, it's really short, and while the premise is at least colorful, it's still really dull. These are the definition of filler quests that were clearly dropped in just to give us something to do with the overabundance of uncharted worlds we can land on. And unfortunately, they are some of the more plentiful missions in this game. Then we got companion missions, which are missions that are tied to one of our squad mates. There's technically three of these, one for Rex, one for Garrus, and another for Tali. But in actuality, there's really only two, with the shooting gallery quest being last minute tied to Tali. I'll talk about Tali's first because it sucks so bad I need to get it off my chest. We get intel that the Geth are staging an invasion of a star system, and the Alliance asks us to drop onto four different worlds and shut their operations down before they grow too big. It's painfully tedious, and with some of the worst uncharted worlds to boot. But that's not enough because then they give us a surprise fifth planet to clear at the end. All of this is last minute justified by giving us some data on the Geth Tali later asks to make a copy of so she can bring it back to her people so she can complete her rite of passage. This last minute changes it from a boring shooting gallery quest to just a boring companion quest, even though Tali doesn't really get any screen time during the mission. Rex isn't that much better, but it's way shorter, and it's bookended with some dialogue from Rex when he explains what we are looking for and what it means when we are finished with it. He wants us to go get his family armor from a Turian relic hunter on an uncharted world. The armor was taken from his family after the Krogan Rebellion as part of the peace deal, but Rex wants it back now. 
It's been in his family for five generations and is rightfully his. So Shepard brings him down there to kill the Turian collector who stole it and take it back. Rex is happy to some extent to have that piece of his history back because family history is actually very important to the Krogan and this cements his relationship with Shepard. This is the reason he backed down on Vermeer, and that's a pretty cool payoff for a remarkably unremarkable side mission. Then we got Garrus's mission, which isn't that much more developed gameplay-wise, but it's got actual conversations and moral decisions attached to it, making it more effective than the previous two. Back in his days at CSEC, Garrus came across this doctor who'd been cloning people's organs inside his victims and then harvesting them if the organs were good. When Garrus cracked the case, the doctor ran and made his escape aboard a shuttle along with some hostages. Garrus ordered the vessel shot down, but he was overridden by his bosses. So the doctor escaped and presumably continued his twisted racket. Garrus managed to find the doctor's new vessel, and in telling Shepard the story, Shepard figures they ought to go stop this madman. So the Normandy tracks down the ship and the squad moves aboard, finding the vessel full of crazed test subjects they are forced to put down. In one of the rooms, they find the Doctor, whom Garrus recognizes, but the Doctor insists he's crazy. Shepard trusts the word of Garrus over this weird Doctor, though, so they put him down and call it a day. There's no escape this time, Doctor. I'd harvest your organs first, but we don't have the time. You're crazy. He's crazy! Please, don't let him do this to me! Put him out of his misery so we can get going. Gladly. Your days of butchering are over, Doctor. No! Please! Please! That was... satisfying. Good. Remember that feeling. That's how it should be. I will, Commander. Well, I guess we're done here. Finally, we got missions that tell a whole story arc and usually involve several quests. There aren't many of these, but the most noteworthy is the chain that has us running into Cerberus. If you haven't played any of the Mass Effect games, Cerberus is a group that becomes a really integral part of the main story in the second and third games. We find an admiral in the council chambers arguing with someone on the, uh, is the telephone, I guess? A squad member of his has gone missing and he can't seem to find any information. He wants to go check out the planet he'd sent his team to, but now that area is off limits. Being a Spectre though, this isn't a problem for Shepard, so him and his squad head down to investigate only to find the team had been lured over a Thresher Maw nest within Alliance Distress Beacon. After some digging, the Admiral finds out that this was the doing of Cerberus, an Alliance Black Ops organization that has gone rogue and is trying to find ways to make super soldiers or something. He gives Shepard the coordinates for the bases Cerberus was using to conduct their experiments and promptly goes into hiding because, well, now Cerberus is after him too. The next part involves going down into some underground bases and shooting up the Cerberus agents within them. Not exactly the most compelling part of the mission chain, but we eventually find the Admiral dead in a cage with some Rachni. It seems Cerberus had been able to get their hands on quite a few of the weird creatures Shepard has been coming across over the course of the game, and evidence supports that they were indeed running tests on them. He manages to shut down their operations though, getting some closure for the Admiral and his men. Also during his travels, Shepard gets wind of someone killing scientists and is given the location of the last remaining scientist. Surprise, surprise, he worked for Cerberus and he too has been responsible for working on abducted soldiers, trying all sorts of really fucked up things to once again make a super soldier. All of this comes from Corporal Toombs, one of the only people to have ever survived their experiments. Having already dealt Cerberus a lethal hand prior, Shepard offers the Corporal the deal of a lifetime. Corporal, if you kill him, you're a criminal. But I'm a specter. Nobody will question me. You can't kill me. You don't know who you're dealing with. He killed my whole unit. I have to take him down myself. It's the last thing I have to do. No. The last thing you have to do is keep going to show these bastards who won. It's... it's really over? Maybe the screaming will stop now. I don't know. All you can do is keep going. Joker, tell the Fifth Fleet we need a ship for pickup. And so, after all this conflict and development, I can see why Bioware wanted to reuse them in Mass Effect 2 and 3. 
but we'll cover that in full when we get to those games. Suffice it to say, for the time being anyway, it seems like Shepard has put down the corrupt organization, but that does well to summarize a lot of the side content in general. The greatest stuff is self-contained and often sandwiched between great conversations that help establish the premise and bring things to a thought-provoking conclusion. Sometimes the budget crunch only allowed the designers to put in some text boxes to explain things, and these text boxes, which harken back to the classic Dungeons and Dragons days, are surprisingly effective and powerful tools that make the quests really stand out in my mind. It makes me wonder what a classic RPG Mass Effect might have looked like had they sacrificed the action and presentation for even deeper writing. But we're straying off topic and we still got a galaxy to save, so it's time to leave the side content behind and get back to that main story. Finally, the Council is ready to take serious action against Siren and the Reapers. They've asked Shepard to come back to the Citadel to discuss their next move, but when Shepard gets there, it becomes clear the Council only wishes to take a defensive stance. Shepard appropriately tells them that Siren is out in the Terminus systems looking for the conduit, which he himself admitted is the key to bringing the Reapers back. Holding back and giving Saren the time he needs to roll out the carpet for an army of sentient AI murder ships is a very stupid call. Shepard insists on at least letting the Normandy go after him, but they are very skeptical about letting Shepard operate in the Terminus systems because that is well beyond the Council's jurisdiction. If he was to say detonate another nuke out there, he'd likely instigate a galactic war. As well, they still don't buy into the Reaper myth, so in their mind, all that's needed is beefed up security so he can attack the Citadel. Which, go figure, is the only part of the conspiracy they actually believe in. So, rather than running the risk of Shepard doing something stupid, the Council, along with Udina, ground the Normandy and lock down its system so it can't leave the station. This gives Shepard and Ashley some private time to get a little more, uh, acquainted. I hate being right. I wish I could say I was surprised. I was surprised Udina bought into it. I guess he's like any other politician. The council's used to being the biggest kid on the playground. They don't want to believe Daddy's coming to pick them up. And eat them, I guess. I don't care if I have to go through the council. I won't let Sovereign win. That's the spirit, Skipper. Whatever you come up with, you can count me in. Sorry to interrupt, Commander. Got a message from Captain Anderson. Are you spying on us, Joker? No, sir. Just knew you were on the ship and figured I'd pass the message on. The Captain said to meet him at Flux, that club down in the wards. Sounds important. You'd better go. Well, it turns out Anderson is not too fond of the idea of letting Saren usher in the end times unopposed and is willing to take one for the team and spring the Normandy from its grounding. So Shepard gets his crew ready while Anderson gets to do something he no doubt has wanted to do for years, and then it's off to Ilos. While in transit, Ashley pays Shepard another visit, but this time in his private quarters. And the two of them engage in a little warm-up session before their final mission. And now, with a little spring in his step, Shepard is ready for the ultimate showdown. They arrive at Ilos and not a minute too soon. Saren and a part of his fleet are already in orbit, landing troops on the long-lost Prothean planet. Thanks to the Normandy stealth systems, they are able to assess the situation, and after some professional discourse over potential landing zones, Joker commits to a difficult Mako drop. They managed to pull it off, but they underestimated Saren's understanding of Ilos' subsystems. He's locked the door, and they don't have enough firepower to get through it. This means they have to double back through the complex to find the security override switch. This results in them having to fight through half a dozen Geth ambushes, but they do get some time to admire this long dead and abandoned Prothean world.
Come on, Saren's already got a head start. We have to go find him before he reaches the conduit. Unless he's already found it, then we're just walking into a trap. That's a chance we'll have to take. Hold on. Something's happening. Too late. Unable to... Invading fleets. No escape. Sounds like some kind of message. But I don't recognize the language. It's probably in Prothean. This recording must be 50,000 years old. No wonder we can't understand it. The message is all broken up, but I recognize some of the words. It's a warning against the Reaper invasion. Incredible. The cipher must have transferred an understanding of the Prothean language into your mind. Not safe. Seek refuge. Inside the archives. What's it say? Can you make out anything useful? Fought Reapers. The Citadel. Overwhelmed. Only hope. Act of desperation. The conduit. All is lost. It said something about the conduit, but it's too degraded to help. We should go. Cannot be stopped. Cannot be stopped. With the security lockdown lifted, they are now able to make it into the tunnels. Saren once again left behind some ambushes, but these aren't enough to even slow the team down as they barrel through with the Mako. The only things that do stop them are a couple of barrier curtains that block them off from progressing forward or falling back. Their only option is to head into an elevator on foot. They descend deeper into the depths of this strange ancient facility until they meet Vigil. You are not Prothean, but you are not machine either. This eventuality was one of many that was anticipated. This is why we sent our warning through the beacons. Looks like some kind of VI program. Pretty badly damaged. I do not sense the taint of indoctrination upon any of you. Unlike the other that passed recently, perhaps there is still hope. Wait a minute. How come I can understand you? Why aren't you speaking the Prothean language? I have been monitoring your communication since you arrived at this facility. I have translated my output into a format you will comprehend. My name is Vigil. You are safe here for the moment, but that is likely to change. Soon, nowhere will be safe. Vigil is an ancient Prothean VI interface that has managed to keep itself alive for 50,000 years to deliver one last message from an extinct race. It tells them that they need to know the mistakes of the Protheans or else they will fall victim to the same fate. Ilos was a secret research facility, hardly anyone knew of its existence, and it was here the Protheans attempted to crack the secrets of mass relay technology. They managed to partially succeed when they built the Conduit, a one-way portal from Ilos to the Citadel. Saren has been looking for it because he can use it as a backdoor onto the Citadel in order to bypass all the security of the station and manually take control of it. You see, the Citadel isn't just some random space station floating around to act as a neat little base for organics. It is in fact a giant mass relay that links with dark space that had been purposefully built by the Reapers. When the time for their return had come, they would activate the Citadel systems and they'd be able to pour through and begin the harvest. Only when they did this this time around, the Citadel didn't respond leaving the Reapers trapped in dark space. Sovereign, who was presumably left behind for just this sort of scenario, was forced to figure out what went wrong and come up with another solution. What had happened was during the reaping of the Protheans, Ilos had been overlooked, and the researchers there went into cryostatic hibernation to wait out the invasion. After a few centuries, only a dozen of them were able to be awoken, so rather than trying to rebuild the Prothean species, they vowed to figure out how to keep the Reapers from invading ever again. They spent decades researching a solution until they developed a way to sever the Reapers' connection to the Citadel. Using the conduit, they went to the station and deployed the solution, which freed the Keepers from the Reapers' control. But the true fate of the Protheans and the biggest secrets of the Citadel aren't the only things Vigil has for Shepard. The VI also gives him a copy of the program the researchers used to gain access to the Citadel. This will give Shepard control and hopefully should give him enough of an edge over Saren and Sovereign to ruin their plans. The team then bids the lonesome VI farewell and head back to the Mako to finish this. 
Ilos is quite possibly my favorite level in a video game. Everything about it is damn near perfectly executed. The environment is so alien, desolate, and bleak, but paradoxically beautiful and disturbingly familiar. There's these statues that were presumably Protheans, so they were retconned to be some other species in later games, but these statues are eerie and haunting, and it makes me wonder why they'd have been installed in a research facility like this in the first place. But looking at these statues from a more clinical angle, we can see the Lovecraftian influences Bioware had used when coming up with the Prothean Extinction and the Reapers. One of the calling cards for the Lovecraftian motif is tentacles and squid-like monsters. The Protheans got the tentacles, and the Reapers definitely got the squid thing covered. I mean, the similarities run way deeper than just that, but that's gonna be a topic for another day. I just really appreciated how thematically relevant the design of Ilos was to the much deeper tones of Mass Effect, because at its heart, Mass Effect 1 kind of falls into the genre of cosmic horror. We were also treated to some of the best music tracks in the game on this level, one of which plays on the main menu, acting as some sort of foreshadowing. This really gives this level a feeling of finality as everything comes full circle by the time we meet Vigil. He leaves almost nothing unanswered except for the all-consuming question of why. We still don't know why the Reapers do this or who created them, but as Vigil aptly puts it, our survival isn't based on understanding them, it's based on stopping them. There is so much to this level that can't be appropriately put into words. You just feel this place, and that's the hallmark of an exceptional video game level. You almost forget you're playing a game because if you've made it this far, you're most likely at your maximum level of investment, and the ambience of Ilos is just able to wash over you and commandeer your senses. This is a level that a game has to earn. This is the result of hours of meticulous world building, characterization, and expert storytelling. You can't just drop an Ilos into a game and expect it to work. You have to build towards it. It's a destination you build the rest of your story around. There is no other way to achieve this effect otherwise. And it's a testament to the careful design choices that went into this game. And I'll always admire it for what it managed to make me feel and the work it must have taken Bioware to make it all happen. With the attack underway, Shepard and squad punch through an armored wall of Geth up to the conduit, which Saren has helpfully left activated for a few more seconds. Just enough time for them to get warped to the Citadel hot on Saren's heels. The Citadel is looking a little worse for wear since they'd last seen it, but despite the chaos, the Council managed to get evacuated, though nobody else can be accounted for. It doesn't matter, helping survivors is not Shepard's agenda. Killing Saren is all that matters. They take the elevator up to the council chambers, but Sovereign and Saren manage to take control of the station and shut the elevators down. Undeterred, Shepard and his squad blast their way out of the elevator and begin scaling the exterior thanks to the lack of gravity in their magnetic boots. They begin the final ascent on foot, battling waves of Geth and Krogan as Sovereign looms above at the top of the tower. They make it to the top though, and then it's time to face Saren once and for all. Shepard. 
had to wipe out a few hundred of your followers along the way. Sorry if I kept you waiting. You've lost. You know that, don't you? In a few minutes, Sovereign will have full control of all the Citadel systems. The relay will open. The Reapers will return. I'm heading to that master control panel, and you can't stop me. You survived our encounter on Vermeer, but I've changed since then. Improved. Sovereign has upgraded me. Fancy hardware is not going to save you. You don't understand, Shepard. There is a place for organics in the New Order. The Reapers need men and women of action. People like us. Sovereign recognizes your value. You've impressed it. Surrender to the Reapers, and you will be spared. Join us, and we can find a place for you. I'd rather die than live like that. Then you will die. And your companions. Everyone you know and love. Everyone you've ever met. Don't you understand? You will all die. The Reapers can be stopped, not by the Protheans, not by you. The cycle always continues. The Reapers don't use organics. They devour and discard them. As soon as the conquest is over, you'll be cast aside. I have no choice. You saw the visions. You saw what happened to the Protheans. Surrender or death. There are no other options. You could have resisted. You could have fought. Instead, you surrender. You quit. Maybe you're right. Maybe there is still a chance for... The implants. Sovereign is too strong. I'm sorry. It is too late for me. There's still one way to stop this. If you've got the guts. Goodbye, Shepard. Thank you. Vigil's data file worked. I've got control of all systems. Quick, open the station's arms. Maybe the fleet can take Sovereign down. See if you can open a communications channel. The Destiny Ascension. Main drives offline. Kinetic barriers down 40%. The Council is on board. I repeat, the Council is on board. Normandy to the Citadel. Normandy to the Citadel. Please tell me that's you, Commander. You were expecting someone else? We caught that distress call, Commander. I'm sitting here in the Endura sector with the entire Arturus fleet. We can save the Ascension. Just unlock the relays around the Citadel and we'll send the cavalry in. You'd sacrifice human lives to save the Council? What have they ever done for your kind? This is bigger than humanity. Sovereign's a threat to every organic species in the galaxy. That's why you can't throw away reinforcements trying to save the Council. Hold them back until the Citadel arms open up and the human fleet can go after Sovereign. What's the order, Commander? Come in now to save the Ascension, or hold back? Hold off, Joker. We're not sacrificing human lives to save the Council. Keep our ships back until they can get a shot at Sovereign. I hope you know what you're doing, human. Don't let the Council die in vain. All Alliance ships are in formation. Wait for a shot at Sovereign. Nothing else matters. I repeat, nothing else matters. Commander, we're picking up reinforcements. It's the Alliance. Open a comm channel. This is the Ascension. We're taking heavy damage. Guardian defenses are over... Kinetic barriers are offline. Commander. Close the channel.
Make sure he's dead. With the Battle of the Century raging outside, Shepard and his squad square off against Sovereign's corporeal form. In the end, they are proven victorious, stunning the ship outside long enough for the Normandy to deliver a killing blow. Safe now. Where's the commander? got your message, Ambassador. What's all this about? No need to get worked up, Captain. I'd like to end this meeting with all my teeth still in place. You should thank me for what I did. If the Normandy were still grounded, we'd all be dead right now. I understand, Captain. You did what you had to do. That's not why you're here. 
We need to talk about what happened to the Council. Commander Shepard did the right thing. We had to hold our fleet back to go after Sarbon. It was the only way. I agree, but this also presents us with an opportunity. The Council is dead. The galaxy is looking for leadership. The Citadel fleets were decimated in the attack. The losses have made the Alliance stronger. If we step forward now, nobody will be able to stop us. The Council was always holding us back. When I saw the opportunity to get rid of them, I took it. Good God, Shepard. How can you even say that? Don't act so surprised, Captain. We all know it's true. Sacrificing the Council assured our victory over Sovereign. The end justified the means. We humans understand that. It's what makes us stronger than the others. What are you saying? The galaxy needs leadership, real leadership. When a crisis hits, we can't be paralyzed by debate like the old council. The new council must rule with a single voice. It must be assembled from one species alone, humanity. The rest of the galaxy isn't just gonna bow down because we tell them to. We'll need the fleets to bring them in line. The other species are scared. They've never faced anything like this before, and they don't know what to do. They want us to step forward. They believe in humanity because of you. Your ruthless pursuit of Saren and the Geth, your defiance of the Council, that's what humans are capable of. That's how we can defeat the Reapers. The others will follow us, Shepard. They know where their only hope. We will have a human Council with a human chairman. The Ambassador's right. I may not like it, but we can't deny the truth. Given everything you've done, Commander, the Alliance will want to know who you think our Chairman should be. Let the politicians figure this one out. I've got real work to do. The Reapers are still out there. And I'm gonna find some way to stop them. Shepard's right. We're headed for war with the Reapers. If we lose, it's the end of all life as we know it. And no other species in the galaxy truly understands what it will take to survive. The other races will have to follow our lead. We need to take control. It's time for humanity to rise up and seize its destiny. Just like how humanity entered the galactic stage in Underdog, forced to fight its way to the adults' table, so too did Bioware have to fight to put themselves on the map with Mass Effect. Before this game, they were a respected studio, but still a relative unknown independent developer. They had some decent hits, but nothing compared to the juggernaut Mass Effect would become. They brought their A-game though, concocting a whole new IP with some of the deepest lore a game of this scale and budget had ever seen. In one game, they turned Mass Effect from a complete unknown into a household name, a true benchmark the industry would have to contend with. This game has a certain charisma to it, a degree of confidence the creators had in the world story and characters that they did everything they could to make it as palatable as possible to the mainstream while still retaining the masterful writing. To this day, I don't think anyone has managed to strike that maddening balance between broad range appeal and genuine artistry as well as Mass Effect 1 did. Mass Effect 2's success was pretty much guaranteed once the credits rolled for this game. Some people love this franchise for its characters. Ask fans who their favorite squad mates are and you'll get so many different answers your head will spin. Some people love the story, and if you ask them what their favorite moment in the franchise is, once again, you're going to get a huge range of responses. Then there's those who just fell in love with the world, and I think that's the group I end up falling in with. This galaxy of mystery is what ultimately captivated my 15-year-old imagination back in 2008. I'd never played something with this level of depth to its characters, storytelling, and world building. 
Mass Effect was the reason I became a fan of science fiction in general. In looking back, even if the mystery is pretty much answered and gone now, I can still appreciate how this game was able to tell such a great story while respecting the contours of its world. Bioware had been careful with what they had introduced in order to maintain that consistency that was needed for this world to be so believable, and look to the world that they had created for indications of where the story and the player ought to go. I wish I could say, oh man, but the sequels were just so much better, but I can't. What I loved about this first game would practically vanish in later installments. I hate ending something like this on a sour note, but as much as I've tried, I can't look at this game. A game that got so much right and just not think about the enormous black cloud it sits under. And I think a lot of people can sympathize with that sentiment, even if they did love Mass Effect 2. That's not to say I think the second and third games are irredeemable, there's plenty to love about them, especially Mass Effect 2. There is a reason this franchise didn't disappear into obscurity after just the first title, but I do intend on taking a deeper look at both 2 and 3 and discussing where they are similar and where they differ. In doing so, I hope to demonstrate the importance of consistent world building in a series such as this, and how a breakdown of that can lead to the collapse of the entire story as a whole. But I'm also going to highlight what the latter two games did right, and hopefully in doing so, I can find a new way to better appreciate these games as a whole. Because Mass Effect set out to create a legacy, and it most certainly did, I plan on exploring what that legacy really is. So on top of another two videos like this one, I also got a few other random topics I'd like to look at, such as a deeper look at the cosmic horror elements of Mass Effect, and maybe a few other topics I've been kicking around for the years. Hopefully I can get all of this done over the summer, uh, that's the plan anyhow. If any of this sounds at all appealing to you, I'd really suggest you subscribing to the channel. As I've been writing this script and working on this video, I've been watching my channel suddenly growing with exponential speed, and I truly cannot put into words how much it means to see this support coming in. My plan is just to keep doing what I've been doing from the start, which is making the best videos I possibly can on games I feel I got a lot to say about. I'm still planning a Discord or something like that, because there's been a lot of interesting discussions happening now in the comments of these videos, and having a proper place for them would be better than the wonky comments section, I feel like. But right now I'm up to my neck working on these videos at the moment, so I might be a little while still. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. I thought you were a hero! Heroes don't do things like this! I wish I'd never met you. Time's up. Company's coming. Ask Fidan. Ask him about the- ah!